I don't know, with 10 years or nine years of classes. I watch guys go out into the ministry and despite great potential, great passion, they sometimes just don't fulfill potential. And they don't fulfill potential not because they're bad guys, they just don't have the support they need. And somehow in seminaries, we've come to believe that if we train you four years or thereabouts, you're ready to go. And if you're in ministry, you know that's not true. You know you have a foundation laid. But you're going to need allies and support because you're going to be developing and building on what has been invested in you. And part of my messaging to John MacArthur and to my seminary brothers is we invest tons in training and family sacrifice and seminarian sacrifice. They invest so much. And then we stop investing when they leave, which I think is foolhardy. I think you have to preserve the investment. And so part of the reason why I come to Wyoming, the beauty, the brotherhood, but because the priority. Brothers need brothers. You're a man and a Christian first, not a pastor first, or an elder first, or a deacon first. You're a follower of Jesus Christ, and you need brothers. Accountability is the friend of integrity. You need encouragement and support. Everybody's on their own spiritual journey with Christ, and you need allies. And then if you're a pastor, you need pastors. You need brothers who get what you do. It's like firemen get firemen, and pastors get pastors, and hunters get hunters. Musicians like Neil and I, we get each other now. <laughs> There's just something inherent in, in shared stuff. And when you're a pastor, you're living a different life than everybody else. You're living a different life than anybody else. And it's helpful to have guys who live your life to be able to partner with you, talk to you about the ebbs and flows and the challenges and the situations. And I'm a brother and I'm a pastor. So we can talk shop and we can talk brotherhood. And then I'm also convinced that if you're a leader, you keep learning. Leaders need leaders. I mean, part of the great benefit I have at being where I am, university seminaries, everybody around me is smarter than me. And I'm not exaggerating. It's very humbling. More gifted, just more capable, and it's stimulating and encouraging. I mean, it's humbling, but it's helpful because you level up. You're playing with guys that are better than you. And if there's anything you want to do as a Christian is get somebody who's faster and smarter and more passionate than you are. It'll help you level up. And if you're a pastor, you want to be around guys who are as good or better than you are because it'll stimulate you to be the best you can be. And so the Master's Fellowship is about that. Fundamentally, it's about that. That's why it's not denominational. It's not the church. It's you. It's men, brothers, pastors, leaders, learning together, growing together, walking together. And I personally believe it's essential. The church is essential, and fellowship among church leaders is essential because the church is led by elders, deacons, pastors, ministry servants, and we're only gone as far as leadership takes us. Can you say amen to that? Every, you didn't say that loud enough. You're the leaders. You should believe that. Everything rises and falls on leadership. It does. If you're healthy, church is going to be healthy. Even if it's hard, it'll be healthy. So that's why this matters, and I'm glad to be with you. Um, my wife normally gets to join me because we just love the few extra days we tack on to see the Grand Tetons and maybe things you take for granted, but I sure don't. And, uh, but we're moving to Tennessee, and um, I love what I do. I'm not leaving because I don't love it. I'm leaving because uh, my wife's mom and dad need help, and uh, that part of the country is where they are, and we're going to help. And um, I love local church, so it's not hard to go be a pastor in a local church. And 
and I uh, love the South, truthfully. I was 27 years there. I love barbecue, and I love Southern people. And if you've been in the South, you understand why the culture is appealing. Um, so we're moving, and we're, she's stressed about all the boxes and the stuff that goes in those boxes, and what do you take, and we're trying to minimize and lighten the load, and that's hard. And uh, so she's not with me, not because we wouldn't have enjoyed some of it, but she'd have been stressed. So will you be nice to me and act like you're my friend so I'm not lonely? <laughs> Take your Bible. I want you to join me in Mark chapter 6. I don't know if it was Matt or Eric that talked to me about our theme for our few sessions together. But the theme that we're going to talk about and focus on is triumphing in trouble, dealing with difficulty. Core convictions, things you need to know. You know, it's the Job statement in chapter 14, man who is born of woman is a few days and full of trouble. And somebody said, you're either in trouble, just getting out of trouble, or about to get into trouble. And this is not meant to discourage you session number one. It's just to acknowledge the reality that life is hard. Ministry is hard. Health issues, relational issues, spiritual life issues, church issues. There are a lot of pastors who don't burn out. They get broken. And they give up. And so you have to learn how to navigate difficulties in life. So we're going to talk about that and the things that I'm going to share with you tonight and tomorrow morning. I discovered in Mark's Gospel when I was walking through it expositionally with my church in Birmingham and it profoundly affected me because I have challenges in my home with illness. And um, I'm a pastor and churches are not, I tell my seminary guys, are going to be more hard days than you know, let's raise the flag and play the trumpets. Um, you, you're going to have to be able to deal with difficulty. And if you read the New Testament honestly, you've got to know it's not smooth sailing for the body of Christ and the people of God who have a heart to serve Him. Persecution in the world, challenges from the inside, the enemy that uh, seeks to devour prowls like a, a lion, no place safe, life's hard. So I want to talk about some critical truths, core convictions you need to have for the crucible. Because hard times are purposeful times. I'm going to talk about that tomorrow when your gals are here, those of you that will have your wives with you. Are we doing that, right? Tomorrow? Yeah. Tomorrow I'm going to do a session on uh, triumphing in trouble together. Because difficulty can separate you. But tonight I want to walk you through the first of two messages out of the same passage. With a look from two different angles, two different lenses. Tonight's lens is what you need to know about Jesus. Tomorrow's morning's message is what you need to know about yourself as a disciple, as a ministry servant, as a follower. Truths that emerge out of this passage that have to do with us in our humanity and our natural propensities. Tonight we're going to focus on essential truths that you need to know about your leader and Lord. This, Mark chapter 6, is in a teaching season. Words and work. Jesus is doing things and he's saying things. The disciples are commissioned in chapter 3. He calls the disciples. They have just come back from their first excursion two by two. Take nothing with you. Rely totally on me. They've just come back. They've reported. Another training session happens training exercise. 
where there's the feeding of the 5,000, really probably 20,000. 5,000 men, could have been 25,000 people. The loaves and the fishes. And then you have the passage we're in tonight. So the big idea is this is training for those who would be ministry servants, commissioned to lead people to Christ and to help them look and walk like Christ. And then ultimately to enter into the mission of Christ. Chapter 6, verse 33, is the feeding of the 5,000 down through verse 44, where they're fed and there's food left over and everybody's satisfied. And the takeaway lesson there is, and I'm just going to give you the big idea that I think is worth at least hearing is he's teaching his disciples about our responsibility. Because he says to them in verse 37, you give them something to eat. You do it. You have a responsibility to provide, care for, invest in God's people. But if you don't have the assets sufficient for that, you know the other big lesson is not your responsibility, it's his great ability. There's two big ideas he wants his disciples to learn in the training exercise of the feeding of the 5,000 is you have a responsibility. Remember they wanted to send them somewhere else? He said, no, you feed them. What do you have, which is the other big idea? I can do a lot with whatever little you have. I can do a lot with your little if you'll give it to me for them. And I expect you to. And if we wanted to camp on that passage, we could do some good by reflecting on the fact that we're all inadequate, but he's, a, he's significantly adequate. He's abundantly adequate. It's not about what Cornerstone Church has here, or your church, wherever it is. Like my church at Grace, we have an abundance of assets. It's very easy to be like, wow, we got money in the bank. We've got ministries here, there, and everywhere. Most people, most pastors don't experience that. And frankly, we've not experienced any season like the one we're in. I mean, the university owns 30 homes in the neighborhood, and they are not cheap. I was at the university the first go around when we couldn't hardly fix anything. We deferred maintenance everything. The blessing we're enjoying is rare. But it's also not normative in terms of ministry life. But what the feeding of the 5,000 is meant to communicate is, hey, I've got what you don't have. Give me what you have and watch me work. That's an essential ministry lesson for would-be SEAL team members of the kingdom of God. Chapter 6. Verse 45 through verse 52 is, in my opinion, one of the most hard to learn yet non negotiable essential lessons for every disciple and every ministry servant. You don't get this, you don't get it, and if you don't get it, you'll repeat until you get it. This is meant to provide the confused the concerned, the tired, the weary in the way disciples, confidence and comfort to encourage you. This passage is meant to help you navigate, like these guys did, the long dark night. When you're rowing all night and you don't seem to be going anywhere. This is a passage to help you when you feel helpless. Hopeless. This is what you need to learn about Jesus so that it strengthens you about knowing him, his capacity, his knowledge, his capacity, and his care for his disciples. Gentlemen, this is uber important. And if you're going to be a successful servant of God, disciple of God, follower of Jesus Christ. You need to learn these lessons about Him. 
Now I want you to imagine for the sake of just thinking our way through this passage that the speaker tonight is Jesus. And it's after we've been rowing all night long, going nowhere. It's after this exercise is over and we're sitting down debriefing, which he often did. So it's not a stretch to say this could have happened. I imagine that after the exercise, the king of everything saying, guys, there's some things I wanted you to learn in this exercise. Things that I wanted you to learn about me. So let's talk about those things. This is what you should have extracted from this journey that we just took together. All right, let's read it, and then we'll work our way through it. Mark 6, verse 45. And immediately, that's after the feeding of the 5,000 up to 25,000, he, that's Jesus, made his disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side to Bethsaida, northeast shore of Galilee. So go that way. And after bidding them, oh, and, and then it goes on to say, and while he himself was sending the multitude away. And after bidding them, verse 46, farewell, he departed to the mountain to pray. And when, he, when it was evening, the boat was in the midst of the sea. John's Gospel, parallel passage, chapter 6, says three to four miles out. Good distance. While they were in the midst of the sea, and he was alone on the land, and seeing them straining at the oars, besidnos, it's a word for tortured, it's painful strain, for the wind was against them about the fourth watch of the night. He, Jesus, came to them walking on the sea, and he intended to pass by them. And when they saw him walking on the sea, they supposed that it was a ghost, And they cried out, for they all saw him, and they were frightened. But immediately he spoke with them and said to them, Take courage, it is I, do not be afraid. And he got into the boat with them, and the wind stopped, and they were greatly astonished, for they had not gained any insight from the incident of the loaves, but their heart was hardened. Things I want you to know, gentlemen, disciples of mine, spiritual influencers for my glory, I want to sit down, I want to debrief with you after this training message, and I want you to understand some things you got to know about me. Number one, I am sovereign. I am the king who rules over everything and everyone. I am sovereign, which means I rule. I act. I don't react. I'm in charge. I have a purpose. I have a plan. And I am operating according to that plan. I am never reacting. I am always acting. I am never passive. I am purposeful. Nothing's random. I am sovereign. Now the backstory helps you with this, and Mark's gospel doesn't include it. John's gospel does. Parallel passage. John 6, verse 14. Contextually, same, situ- same, same scenario, same, ish- same event. When therefore the people saw the sign, That's the backdrop. When the people saw the sign, sign being the visible validation pointing to the identity, validity, and ability of Jesus Christ. The sign pointing to him. Who is he? The feeding of the 5,000. They saw that sign. It was meant to help them understand who he was. It's a visible validation of his identity, his capacity, his deity. They saw that which he had performed, and they said, this is of truth. This is a truth, the prophet who has come into the world. So they're saying this is the Messiah, the anticipated one. Mark doesn't tell you that. But that's what was happening. They saw this miracle, this sign, this validation of who he was, and they're saying this is the prophet. 
And then John's Gospel, verse 15, says, Jesus therefore, perceiving that they were intending to come and take him by force, grab him, force him, to make him king, withdrew again to the mountain by himself alone to pray. Now, with that background in mind, I want you to watch the words. He himself, verse 45, sent the multitude away. They're going to seize him, and he, by authoritative command, dismisses them. It wasn't just, no, you can't grab me. No, you're going home. There's authoritative language both with his dispatching the disciples, he immediately, he, and immediately, verse 45, he made his disciples get into the boat. The word is compelled. Hey, everybody, boats. He made them. Like it wasn't optional. And then the crowd that wanted to force him to be king, no, you're leaving. And what you see there is the exercise of his sovereignty, his authority. It doesn't matter what others want to do. It would be like this. The first training lesson would sound like this. I have a plan, and that plan is not determined by the will of the people, but by the will of God. I have a time which is defined by the Father, not by the circumstance. I am sovereign. I'm not a victim. I'm in control, not the crowd or the culture. I have authority regardless of the majority and the will of the many. He constrained his disciples. Arist active indicative. It's a forceful word. He made them. He himself. It's emphatic. So it's not just he made them, he himself, personally. Hey, this table, out. It's got that vibe to it. It's the exercise of authority. He constrained them, the disciples. He sent the multitude away. I'm not going to be forced. I've got my own plan. And I want you to recognize my authority. They did, we should. The takeaway in my mind is you need to rest in the rule of the King of Kings. If he was talking, I think he could say, gentlemen, I don't need you to accomplish my will my way. I'm sending you away. I have a plan. I have a time frame. I'll work it out no matter the pressure or the challenge. I'm sovereign. Yes, I'm a servant, but I'm a king. Yes, I'm a savior, but I'm a sovereign. I'm working all things according to my sovereign plan. Don't be anxious. Be confident. It is not dependent on your actions or somebody else's actions. Relax. Obey me. Submit to me. Follow me. And wait on me. Now listen. One of the most important discipleship convictions you need to have is you're king and I'm not. And I'm going to rest in your rule. This is seen all through the New Testament, this business of sovereignty. I mean, if we want to just color it out a little bit, which we don't have enough time to do fully tonight, but you can strengthen your foundational conviction that God is sovereign with regard to the process, the timing, and every actor in the process. You feel the time in John 2 when he says to his mother, dear woman, what do I have to do with you? Remember, they want wine, they're out of wine, can you do that? Mother or dear woman, what do I have to do with you? My hour has not yet come. To his family in John 7, they wanted him to go up to the feast and show off to the world because they thought clearly that was his intention. And he says to them, verse 6, John 7, my time is not yet at hand. I do not go up to this feast because my time has not yet fully come. John 7, just a few verses later, he's talking to his adversaries in the temple. 
And his adversaries come up and they, they ask him some questions and he says of himself, I know him, referring to the Father, because I am from him, verse 29, he sent me and they were seeking therefore to seize him, same word as we saw before, they wanted to force him and no man laid a hand on him because his hour had not yet come. John 8, 19 and 20, to another group in the temple treasury, he spoke these words in the temple treasury. He, they were saying to him, where's your father? And Jesus said, you know neither me nor my father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. And these words he spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple. And no one seized him because his hour had not yet come. You have this idea that there's a sovereign plan, sovereign timing, and it doesn't matter what else is happening. If it's not time, it's not time. God's ruling. Guys, I rule. I rule all of it. The timing of it. And then he has in Luke chapter 9 when it's, Jesus said, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. And he resolutely set his face to go to Jerusalem. John 13, 1, before the feast of the Passover, Jesus knowing that his hour had come, that he should depart out of the world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world. He loved them to the end. This is time. John 17, Father, the hour has come. Sovereign. Timing. Ruling. Not reacting. And it's true for us, not just, through, just for the purposes of God. This is the plan and redemption of God that involves the redeemed, not just the redeemer. Romans 5, 6, for a while we were still helpless at the right time. Design, purpose, Christ died for the ungodly. 1 Timothy 2, verse 5, One God, one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, the testimony born at the proper time. Acts 2, 23, Peter, this man you delivered up by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. I have a plan. I'm sovereign. You see it with the dispatching of the disciples. Don't need you. Saw it with the dispatching of the multitude. You want me to be king? It's not time for me to be king. He stands before Pilate in John chapter 19. And Pilate said, hey, you do not speak to me. Do you not know that I have authority to release you and I have authority to crucify you? And Jesus said, you would have no authority over me unless it's been given to you. I have authority over everything and everybody. Remember he said, nobody takes my life. I lay it down by my own authority. And then maybe strongest of all is this Ephesians benediction statement in Ephesians 1, 11, In Him, Christ, we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of Him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of His will in order that we... That would include us who were the first to hope in Christ might be for the praise of His glory. Isaiah 25, 1, the praise of Isaiah. Thou art my God, I will exalt thee, I will give thanks to your name, for you have worked wonders, plans formed long ago with perfect faithfulness. Acts 4, 28. Hear this prayer foundation of the praise that was being offered in that message there. What is happening is happening because they, the actors, even bad ones like Herod, Pontius Pilate, the Gentiles and the Jews, even bad ones are gathered together to do whatever your hand, your power and your purpose predestined, decided beforehand to occur. Guys, let me, I, I, know, I, I know I'm beating a dead horse, but I want you to hear how powerfully redundant the Bible is as it relates to the sovereign, authoritative plans, purposes of God. And that includes you, His disciple, and everything that it has to do with you. Everything is in conformity with the purpose of His will. He's working it out. Rest in that rule. He's sovereign. He shows it here and throughout the Scriptures. I like this quote. God works all things according to the same principle 
And God's will is the expression of infinite perfections and must be infinitely holy, wise, and good with unlimited, omnipotent authority and power. Man plans his way. We plan our way. But Yahweh ordains, directs our steps. Look, God does more than guide your steps. He determines your steps. The lesson number two that I think he would have you know, and by the way, knowing that means go do what he's asking you to do and keep doing it. Because what do you do when you don't know, don't know what to do? You keep doing what God's asked you to do. If he's dispatched you to row to the other side, keep rowing. And some of us are concerned about the trends of the culture and the circumstances of our ministry and Jesus has commissioned us to do something and it's really hard. If he's commissioned you, keep doing what he's commissioned you to do. If he said it, if he confirmed it, keep doing it. I mean, that's what you have in this section. He commissioned them. He made his disciples get in the boat. And then it says in verse 46, he bid them farewell. It wasn't like, hey, fellas, where are you going? It was the affirmation of what he had asked them to do. Number two, verse 46. I think he would want you to know he's not only sovereign, he's human. Because verse 46 says he departed to pray. When alone, he departed to the mountain to pray. And he was alone on the land, verse 47. John 6.15 says he withdrew again to the mountain by himself alone. Do you see the word again? Because Luke 5.16 says he himself would often slip away to the wilderness and pray. Customary and perfect. It was a pattern. Matthew 14, parallel passage. After he had sent the multitude away, he went up into the mountains alone to pray. Here's a life lesson. Jesus Christ was a human being, and as a human being, he needed what you need. He needed time alone with God for rest and refreshment. It was his custom to get away and pray because time alone with God was essential to service for God. Jesus sent them away so he could be alone to pray. I wrote in my notes here, there are some things you can't de do in a crowd, even a Christian one. Jesus needed rest. He needed refreshment. I get tired. I get weary. I give and I get empty. I need time alone with the Father. I need to pray and commune one-on-one. -on -one. I'm a man and I need to be alone in the presence of God. I'm a human and I need God. Listen, here's the truth we need to take away from this passage. If Jesus Christ needed this, you need it. I need God, Jesus talking, and so do you. I am human. I understand your human need and your human weakness. I want you to do what I do. Rest in my rule and rest in God like I rest in God. Now listen, they were tired, just like he was tired. Mark chapter 6 says they had come back from their travels. They preached that men should repent. This is 6, 7 through 13. So they're coming back from their preaching ministry. Then you have this little interlude in chapter 6, 14 through 29, where John the Baptist is beheaded. You know that story. Matthew's Gospel says after John was beheaded, it was reported, his disciples took the body and they reported to Jesus that John was dead. 
So you've got physical fatigue, you've got emotional fatigue, trauma from the death of John, and you have the overwhelming activity of ministry after they'd been sent two by two. They've come back, they get the negative report about John. They're tired. Look at verse 30. And the apostles gathered together with Jesus. They reported to him all they had done and taught. They also reported according to Matthew, the death of John. And, and Jesus said, verse 31, he said to them, come away by yourselves to a lonely place and rest a while. For there were many people coming and going and they did not even have time to eat. And they went away in the boat to a lonely place by themselves. Now don't miss this. Don't miss the fact that ministry fatigue, emotional fatigue, physical and ministry activity can deplete you and you need to do what they did, what he told them to do, and then what he modeled for them to do. And it didn't go very well because the people saw them going, verse 33, many recognized them, and they ran there together on foot from all the cities and got there ahead of them and disembarking he saw a great multitude, he felt compassion for them because they were like sheep without a shepherd, and he began to teach them back into the ministry mode. Then the disciples get asked, hey, where are we going to feed this crowd with? So the rest didn't last long enough, but the rest was necessary, and Jesus made it obvious that this priority and pattern needs to be a part of the regular rhythm for those who would follow Christ in their humanity. They need what he needed. And be like him saying to you, listen, do what I do. And do it regularly. You need it, and I need it. Number three in the heart of this passage. I am sovereign I am human, and I am divine. I am a divine companion. Let me sum it up this way. I'm God. Verse 48 says, He came to them walking on the sea, and he intended to pass by them. Now this whole passage really centers on this walking on the sea, intending to pass by. What in the world? Is anybody else besides me bothered by the fact that he intended to pass them by? That is the most important part of this passage. It's the heart of this passage. And it's the most un misunderstood part of this passage. He intended to pass by them. That's what it says. Not he intended to pass them by. He intended to pass by. And that makes a massive difference. Because the intention of this particular exercise. Intending to pass by them. Is the intention to display his divine capacity to them. To confirm his deity. The main goal of this is not to relieve their distress. But to affect them and advance them in the core conviction. That's the heart of this. That he is God. He's their companion. He sees. He cares. He comes. And he rescues. This is not about abandoning them. It's about advancing them. But it's not about relieving their difficulty. It's about re re revealing himself to them. Why? Because apparently it's hard to understand that Jesus is God. That he's divine. This is foundational and it's apparently a hard lesson to learn. Good shepherd, hope for king, prophet, teacher, but God, hard lesson to learn. And I'm going to make that case because in Mark's Gospel, chapter 4, verses 35 through 41, the calming of the winds and the waves, remember what the, general, the guy said? What kind of man is this? That even the sun or the wind and the sea obey him. Not man, this is God. 
What kind of man is this? Then you have chapter 5, 1 through 15, the demoniac that nobody could shackle or control, sitting clothed in his right mind. You would think after the first wave of evidence, this is God. You would think after the demoniac liberated and delivered, sitting in his right mind, this is God. You go to Mark chapter 5, 21 through 43, and the woman with the issue of blood 12 years unable to be healed, then healed by touching his garment. The 12-year-old daughter in Mark's gospel, chapter 5, who is raised from the dead, Jairus' daughter. Then you have Matthew 33, 6, excuse me, Mark 6, 33 through 44, the 5,000 with leftovers from five loaves and two fishes. You would think that would be clear and convinced, non-negotiably, Jesus is God. Wouldn't you? Wouldn't that fair? Of course it would be fair. But verse 52 is the commentary on the reason you have this walk on the water event is verse 52, for they had not gained any insight, what kind of insight, about who Jesus was as God. From the incident of the loaves, but their heart was hardened. It means they were, they were boneheaded. They were dull. They were, they were desensitized spiritually to an observation that should have been obvious. And I'm arguing that you can minister in a way, despite all the things God has done, and not be convinced and locked down on the conviction that you're dealing with God. I can do anything. And the whole purpose of intending to pass by them is the intention to galvanize their conviction because they hadn't achieved that conviction that he is God. Intending to pass by them. Now the key to understanding, and then listen, I could read you some of the strange opinions that people have. Commentators. What does it mean he intended to pass by them. Well, Jesus intended to overtake the disciples and playfully surprise them on the other side. To reveal that he's playful. That he's fun. Can you believe somebody said that? Listen, I'm not thinking this would be loving or compassionate or fun if you were distressed and tortured at the oars to whisk by and leave them floundering in the interest of fun. Jesus, Jesus, somebody else says, Jesus wants to pass by but does not do so when he sees them in distress and changes his mind. But the text says he saw them before he left the land. Jesus is trying to test their faith, someone has said. But what would that test be to see how long they could suffer before they caved in? Let me see how tough you are. Someone says the phrase refers to the fact that the disciples mistakenly, they had a mistaken impression of Jesus' intentions. They think he intends to pass by them. But that's not what the Bible says. He intended to pass by. Some, someone has said he's, he's seen walking on the sea, wants to be seen walking on the sea, but he wants to go unrecognized, thus preserving the messianic secret theme trying to hide his identity. Well, how does that square with the hardened heart commentary that they didn't, that, that, you know, that you have a hard heart because you didn't get it if they were not supposed to know it? Parachamai is the word. Pass by. The Old Testament has to help you. The Old Testament records two big pass by events. And those big pass-by events were striking, undeniable declarations of his divine nature. God made striking and temporary appearances in the earthly realm, says J.P. Meyer, to a select individual or group for the purposes of communicating, listen to this, the critical message they needed at the critical time. I'm God, and I'm with you. Turn with me to Exodus 33, first pass by event. Now 
Now the back story. Moses finds the people partying and Aaron has crafted a golden calf. He comes down from the Mount Sinai with the commandments of God. He shatters those commandments. He takes the golden calf, pulverizes it. 3,000 people die. Spirit of God falls in judgment. And God's conclusion to Moses is, I'm not gone with these people. If I lead these people, these people are going to die. Moses, you lead these people. So we're going to pick up the story in chapter 33, verse 12, where God says to Moses, you lead them. Verse 12, Moses says, whom will you send with me? And God says, my presence will go up with you and I will give you rest. Verse 15, if your presence does not go with us, do not lead us up from here. And basically God says in verse 17, I will lead you. So here's the background. Moses, I'm not going. Moses said, you want me? God says, I want you to lead them. I can't go if you don't go. And Moses is appealing to God to be his ally in leading God's people. And the backstory is things weren't going well. Things were tough. Look, Moses is going to shatter the commandments of God. That's a bad day. When you're so overcome with frustration by what you see among the people that you lead, that you take the commandments by the finger of God, and you shatter those commandments, that's a bad day. When you pulverize what it is they have done, when you see the, the uh, death that results from that bad day, golden calf, people out of control, the Levites kill 3,000, God says, I can't go. If I go, they die. Moses, you lead them. No, I can't lead them unless you go with me. I will go with you. Well, how will I know you're going to go with me? Verse 18. Then Moses said, I pray thee, show me your glory. In other words, expressing, the expression of your divine attributes, God's glory, is the undeniable evidence and assurance that he needed that God was going to go with him. And God said, verse 19, chapter 33, I myself will make all my goodness, now watch this, pass before you and will proclaim the name of Yahweh before you and I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious I will show compassion on whom I will show compassion you cannot see my face for no man can see me and live then the Lord Yahweh said behold there is a place by me you shall stand there on the rock look at verse 22 and it will come about while my glory is passing by that I will put you in the cleft of the rock, cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Pass by event number one is the reassurance by God's presence and glory. The expressions of his divinity passing by. Reassuring Moses that I'm with you. Verse 30, chapter 34, verse 1, Yahweh said to Moses, Cut out for yourself two stone tablets like the former ones, and I will write on the tablets the words that were on the former tablets which you shattered. So be ready by morning. Come up in the morning to Mount Sinai. Present yourself there to me on the top of the mountain. Moses rose up early in the morning, went up to Mount Sinai as the Lord had commanded him, took the two stone tablets in his hand, verse 5, and Yahweh descended in the cloud, stood there with him. Do you see the with him? As he called upon the name of Yahweh, then Yahweh passed by in front of him and proclaimed what? Yahweh. This is Yahweh God, compassionate, gracious, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness and truth. He declares his character, he displays his person, his glory, and he says out loud, this is Yahweh, I'm with you. As a validation 
of the leadership support that Moses needed in order to fulfill the mission that he'd been given. 1 Kings chapter 19, pass by event number 2. Elijah's just defeated the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. After three years of no rain, drought, rain comes. So you have fire fall from heaven. You have rain falling from heaven. Great victory for God. Great blessing and miracle of rain. Verse 1, chapter 19, 1 Kings. That was chapter 18. We now get to chapter 19, giving you the backstory. Now Ahab... King of Israel, pagan king, told Jezebel, his pagan wife, all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. And Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, so may the gods do to me and even more if I do not make your life as the life of one of them, one of those prophets who had been killed by the sword by tomorrow about this time. Verse 3. After a great victory, after the great rain, he, Elijah, was afraid. And he rose and ran for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah. And he left his servant there. And then he went a day's journey into the wilderness, came, verse 4, came down, came and sat down under a juniper tree. And he requested for himself that he might die. And he said, It is enough now, O Lord, take my life, for I am not better than my father's. So you have the servant of God, great victory, who is now fearful and afraid and basically says, I'm alone, I'm tired, I want to die. Verse 9. Well, actually, in... 1 Kings 19, it's worth noting, and I'll turn there instead of reading it from my notes. He went the day's journey into the wilderness. I want to die, verse 5, and he lay down and slept under a juniper tree, and behold, there was an angel touching him and said to him, Arise and eat. He looked, and behold, there was at his head a bread cake baked on hot stones, a jar of water, so he ate and drank and lay down again. Verse 7, And the angel of the Lord came again a second time, touched him, and said, Arise and eat, because the journey's too great for you. So he arose and ate, and went in the strength of that food, forty days and forty nights, to Horeb, the mountain of God. Now look at verse 9. So he wants to die, supernaturally strengthened, the angel of God supporting him with food and rest. Verse 9, He comes to the cave at Mount Horeb, and lodged there, and behold, the word of the Lord came to him and said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? And I just think, you're not where you're supposed to be doing what you're supposed to be doing. You're running in fear. You want to die. You've decommissioned yourself. What are you doing here? Now, Mount Horeb is the place where God, Mount Sinai, it's where he met with God's people. Maybe Elijah's gone back to where he knew God had been. But he wasn't where he was supposed to be. He's seeking to find God. That would be the best explanation, potentially. Look at what God says to him in verse 10. Or what Elijah says to God in response to, what are you doing here? He said, I've been very zealous for the Lord, Yahweh. The God of hosts, for the sons of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, killed your prophets with the sword, and I alone am left, and they seek my life to take it away. So his assessment is, I want to die. I'm all alone. The forecast is bleak. I'm out. Verse 11. And he, that's God, Yahweh, says, go forth, stand on the mountain before Yahweh, and behold, Yahweh, do you see this? Was passing by. And a great and strong wind was rending 
the mountains and breaking in pieces the rocks before Yahweh, but Yahweh was not in the wind, and after the wind an earthquake, but Yahweh was not in the earthquake, and after the earthquake a fire, but Yahweh was not in the fire. In other words, these are all things that God does, but these things aren't God. And after the fire, a sound of a gentle blowing. These are things that I do. This is how I am. I'm gentle. And it came about when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle, taking up his mantle of ministry, and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And behold, a voice came to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? I'm out. I'm all alone. And God says, you go stand there and let me walk by. Let me display my power. Let me display how I am, gentle, with all of this power. And then I'm going to ask you again, what are you doing here? And what he did is he went back to ministry. He anointed Elisha. He went to the kings and prophesied. He went back to work. And my argument is that God's passing by displayed in these two ways in the Old Testament is demonstration that there are times that God's men need the reassurance and reminder that God is who God is and God is with them. And if God is with them, they can do what's hard to do and they can do what they don't feel like they can do. It can strengthen them for the season of ministry before them. He's passing by the men in the boat in order to display what these men needed, which is the assurance that he's God and that he's with them. One can only conclude from these passages that when Jesus wants to pass by his disciples... It's akin to the Old Testament epiphanies of his divinity. And thus Jesus wills the disciples to see his transcendent majesty as a divine being. And this is meant to give them benefit, reassurance for this difficult moment they're in. And gentlemen, listen, and for every other difficult moment they will be in. This is a truth that is essential. And I would argue, too, that it's not just his intention to walk by displaying his glory. Go back with me to Mark's gospel, if you would. As we kind of bring all of this home. If you're walking on the water... It's a declaration that you are doing what only God can do. It says here that he's walking on the water. The Old Testament, Job chapter 9, says it is God who removes the mountains. They know not how. He overturns them in his anger. It is God who shakes the earth out of its place. It is God who alone stretches out the heavens. And listen to this. And it is God alone who treads upon the waves of the sea. But in Mark's Gospel chapter 6, not only is Jesus walking on the water, what he's doing, but notice what he says. This is the other big thing that I want you to see in verse 50. They, They don't recognize him. They saw him. They're frightened because they didn't know who it was. And, he, and immediately he speaks to them, and watch what he says, take courage, it is I. It is I is ego, I, a me, state of being verb, could be translated, I am. So technically, literally, that's what it could be translated. Take courage, It is I is a declaration of his name. I am. I am. This is Jesus doing what only God does and saying what only God would say. We don't have time to look at it tonight, but if you write down Isaiah 43... 
Verse 2 says, God's promising that He's created them, He's redeemed them, and He says to them in Isaiah 43, 2, Yahweh, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. That's that context. Isaiah 43, 10, God says, You're my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, in order that you may know and believe me and understand that I am He, before me there was no God formed, and there will be none after me. Verse 11, Isaiah 43, it is I, even I am the Lord. Same kind of language. There is no Savior beside me. Verse 12, Isaiah 43, God talking, bearing witness to his unique nature. It is I who have declared and saved and proclaimed, there is no strange God among, and there was no strange God among you, so you, my witness, you are my witnesses, declares Yahweh, and I am God. So if you want to compare Isaiah 43 to Mark chapter 6, when Jesus says, it is I, I am, he's using the same language as Isaiah 43 as the validation from God to say, I'm your creator, I'm your redeemer, I am God alone, it is I, I am God. Same language, I'm the one who's with you when you pass through the water. So I would argue that together in his, with his walk, on the water and his words to them in their fear this is undeniable proof and confirmation that Jesus Christ is God turn over to Matthew's gospel chapter 14 parallel passage verse 32 Matthew 14. And when they got into the boat. Now that's a reference to Peter. When they, it's Peter and Jesus, got into the boat. Remember Peter, Peter walked on the water? Then he started to not walk on the water? We're going to talk about that tomorrow. And when they got into the boat, the wind stopped. Now look at verse 33. And those who were in the boat worshipped him saying, what? You are certainly God's son. Mark chapter 6 is the culminating exercise to help them get what they hadn't gotten, but they had to get. You're God. You're the great I am. You see me, and you come and you rescue. And I can rely on that in every point of my ministry life. The bottom line is when Jesus comes strolling across the waters, He's revealing that He shares in the unlimited power and capacity of God, the Creator and the Redeemer. And Jesus is undeniably revealing He is God, the Creator and Redeemer. And it's a brilliant and glorious epiphany. And as God, He is their deliverance. He is their rescuer. He's their provider. And there is no other. Bank on that. Because the God who is sovereign and the God-man who is human is all that God is all the time and His person and His character is revealed in this passage with the concluding statement, life lesson, bottom line, the end of the evening is, I am God and I rescue I am your divine companion. I want you to watch some of the words that just kind of highlight the fact that in his divinity, he sees, he cares, he comes, and he comforts. Now he's alone on the land. John says they're three to four miles out. It's in the fourth watch of the night, which is three to six a.m., the darkest part of the night. Verse 48, watch this participle. He's alone on the land, verse 47, and seeing them. How could he see them? In the darkest part of the night, three to four miles out. 
how he could see them as he's God. And seeing them straining at the oars, for the wind was against them about the fourth watch of the night. Here's the main verb. He came to them. He came to them because he saw them and because he saw their distress, he cared for them, which is why he came to them. I'm going to argue he wasn't done his prayer time or his fellowship time. What he saw was what was needed for his servants. He came to them walking on the sea. And he comforted them with his words. He got into the boat and it all stopped. I want to conclude by saying he is God and he rescues and here's some comforting realities. He sees you even in the middle of the night. He sees you when no light from the sun is visible. He sees you when you're a long ways away. He sees your pain. He sees that the wind is against you. He sees that you're distressed and battered, vexed and tormented. Gentlemen, He sees you when you're hurting. He sees you when it's hard. When you dwell in the remotest part of the sea, Psalm 139, surely the darkness will overwhelm me, the light around me will be night, and if I say that, even the darkness is not dark to God, and the night is so bright as the day. Darkness and light are alike to you. Listen, in your dark night, God sees. Nobody else may see, but He sees. The eyes of the Lord are towards the righteous. The ways of a man are before the eyes of the Lord. He watches all of his paths. His eyes are upon the ways of a man. He sees all of his steps. There is no darkness or deep shadow, Job 34. And that what he sees drives him out of care for you because he cared, because he saw them struggling. He came to them. He comforted them with his presence, with his words. Take courage. It is I, do not be afraid. And with his power, he got into the boat and the wind stopped. And I like John 6.21. And immediately the boat was at the land in which they were going. Here's a core conviction for the crucible. I'm in charge. Rest in that. I'm human. You're human. Rest like I rested. And I am God. I do see you. I do care. I will come. And I will help. That was the lesson. Keep doing what you're doing. And trust me. Father, thank you for the opportunity to reflect on this passage. I do pray in Jesus' name that you would encourage these brothers in the difficult seasons of life, even as you have encouraged these disciples. I pray that we will be locked down and anchored in convictions that will sustain us in the dark night when we're distressed, when we feel separated from Jesus, when we're rowing for all of our effort and we feel like we're going nowhere and we're tempted to give up and give in, would you help us to remember that Jesus is for us, He sees us, He is able, He cares, He comes. And he may come in a way we wouldn't expect at a time we would not have expected. And I pray we would rest in that reality and stand strong in that hope. To that end, I ask it for us all tonight on the strength of this passage and this lesson. Comfort, encourage, support, and help with hope. In Jesus' name I pray. And all God's men said, Amen. Part one. Part two, I'm going to start with a story that was special to me, which I'll tell you in the morning. 
but we'll look at some lessons that are critical to us that I think the Lord would have us know that come out of this same section.